Hello again, everyone. You know, on occasion I get asked to try out restoring other vintage toys, and probably one of the more popular requests is to restore a Tonka truck. Now, honestly, I've put off doing such a video for two major reasons. One, my filming setup is geared to filming small cars, and two, it's hard to find these trucks in a rusted condition that doesn't look good. Hot Wheels are made of Zaymac, and they oxidize to a gray color that doesn't look all that natural to the car. But these Tonka trucks are made of iron, and when they oxidize, they look, well, normal, or what you'd see on the side of the road. Rust adds character to most of these toys, and restoring them sort of takes that away, kind of like removing the patina on a coin. Anyway, that's why I've been hesitant to restore one, at least until I found this one at a recent flea market. Now this gravel spreader still falls into the it looks pretty cool rusted up category, but it's also in a situation where if it's not restored and instead is allowed to continue to oxidize, there's a real risk of it breaking, especially the small tabs that hold in the axles. Given that it's complete and without any major issues outside of a lot of rust, I feel somewhat okay about restoring it. However, stick around to the end of the video because there's a small twist having to do with the rust and you might want to participate in it. Now, I've never restored or even taken one of these models apart, so this may be a learning experience for both of us. But I have to say the engineering is very interesting. I sort of think of it more like metal origami than anything else. The model is held together with small metal tabs that have been incorporated into the stamp parts. To remove items like the axles, I just need to bend the tabs out of the way to free them. To do this, I'm using a specialized bending tool that spreads the bend out over a greater area compared to using a pair of pliers that focuses the bend in one small area. I'm worried about breaking these tabs off, and this bending tool gives me the greatest chance of avoiding that issue. The cab is also held onto the frame with small tabs that need to be bent straight to remove it. Using these tabs was genius on Tonka's part. They literally manufactured their fasteners and attached them to each part as they stamped them out. No doubt this saved pennies on each toy not having to buy rivets or other fasteners to hold everything together. Once the cab was removed, I could then pull out the internal plastic and the windshield, both of which are extremely dirty. This truck has obviously spent a lot of time in a sandbox or a pile of dirt somewhere. I don't really see any large scratches or cracks in the windshield plastic, which is pretty rare as most of these toys were really put through their paces. I'll clean these up later and you can get a better look. Moving over to the trailer portion, the first thing for me to attack is a riveted rod that holds the, I'll call it a gate, in place. This rod is the most substantial part of this toy, so I suspect they had a reason for putting it here compared to just using plain rivets to hold the gate in place. I wonder if they were worried about small kids trying to push fingers and hands down the opening of the spreader and put this rod to keep that from happening. Or they may have just needed this area to be reinforced. It's hard to say. Here on the chute there are some more tabs that I need to straighten out to remove two identical panels on the front and back. Again, well thought out design. By using the same panel for the front and back, less tooling had to be built. Tooling is normally the most expensive part of any manufacturing process, so anything you do to reduce the amount of tooling required saves a ton of money. The last part to be freed is this axle assembly here in the back. They used a small rivet and a large tab to hold this in place. So I'll need to remove the rivet by drilling it out. That will complete the disassembly of this gravel spreader. The next thing I'll need to do is go over the parts and using some jeweler pliers, bend back any bent or distorted areas. This one bend in the trailer is really the only major issue I found at this time, though I will find some more later once all the paint and rust are removed. Since we're on the subject of rust, I decided to attack the rust first. I find that items that are extremely oxidized make paint removal very difficult because the rust protects and holds the paint in place. Actually, by removing the rust, I'll be removing quite a bit of the paint that was only being held on by the rust. I'm using Evaporust to dissolve all the rust from these parts. This stuff works great and I highly recommend it for mild steel parts like this toy. Where these solutions tend to fail is on hardened steel items, things like metal files and drill bits. It works, but not nearly as well. And no, I'm not being sponsored or anything. I just picked this up at the auto parts store. I left the parts in the solution overnight to give it plenty of time to dissolve all that rust. 
I then removed and washed each part with soap and water. After the parts dried, I went to remove the paint. I placed some of the stripper in a glass bowl and then began covering the parts. Once all the parts were covered, I let them sit for about 15 minutes and then started going over them with an expendable toothbrush. This would remove a large portion of the paint, but not all of it, so I would reapply the stripper and repeat. Eventually I was able to remove the vast majority of the paint. What was left I'll remove in a bit with another method. While I was removing the paint, I figured I would go ahead and work on the windshield plastic. You can see here it's quite dirty, so the first thing I'll do is wash off all that dirt and grime with some soap and water. With that removed, I can get a good look at the plastic, and it's in pretty good shape. There are some scratches, but none are deep enough to be an issue. I'll start with some 400 grit sandpaper to remove them all. This first sanding is the most important to get right, as subsequent sandings will only be employed to remove the 400 grit sanding lines. If you start with 400 and find you're really having to spend a lot of time removing the scratches, then you should probably move to something like a 220 grit paper to remove them and then go back with 400 to remove the 220 grit lines. Either way you go, just start moving up the grits to remove the previous grit sanding lines until you get to about 2000. I've mentioned before and I'll mention here again that with plastic you can jump grits compared to sanding something like metal. Once you get to 2000, you can then move to a polishing compound and a polishing wheel to remove all the 2000 grit lines and remove the haze in the plastic. So once I had the plastic polished and washed, I had a rather new looking windshield, albeit the slight yellowing of the plastic that can't be fixed. So while I'm on the subject of plastic, I'll go ahead and clean up the interior plastic with some soap and water so we can get a good look at it. You might be able to see that the plastic has yellowed over the years and I plan to address this later, but right now I want to see if I can remove the rust stains on the bottom. To do this, I dropped the part into the evapo rust and left it overnight. The next morning, I pulled the part out and was pleasantly surprised by how much of the rust had been removed. Next, I want to address the yellowing, so I poured some 40% hydrogen peroxide into a small beaker and dropped the part in. This retroblight technique requires heat and sunlight to work, both of these are in short supply right now where I live. In fact, this is the first time the sun poked through the clouds in days, so I ran outside and set this up only for the sun to go back behind the clouds about an hour later. As such, I didn't have the part in the solution long enough. But later in the week, I was able to get it in the sun longer and was able to remove the vast majority of the yellowing. Also, since the hydrogen peroxide attacks rust, I found that by the end of the retrobrite process, almost all the rust stains were gone. I mentioned earlier that I was able to remove most of the paint, but not all of it. If you've seen my previous video on restoring the 18 Redline Hot Wheels, you might have heard me talk about getting some new tools to speed the project up. One of these new tools is this sand blaster cabinet. The other is a soda blaster, but that will be shown in a future video. Now I bought this after I had removed most of the paint from this truck, and I know that this setup will have had no issue removing all of it, paint and rust. But I have heard that you should avoid doing that because the paint flakes will jam up the gun since the blasting medium is recycled and not really filtered. This is my first sandblasting outside of the small air eraser I use, so I would be interested in other opinions on if this is in fact an issue. If I use it to remove large amounts of paint, should I filter the medium after I'm done? Any comments on this would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, it doesn't take me too long to move through each of the parts and remove the residual paint. So here's how the parts looked after sandblasting. All the paint has been removed and I can now get a good look at each part. One thing I did notice is that the bumper of the truck has been partially eaten away by the rust. So I'd like to fix that. Now there are several ways of going about this with the simplest and safest being some putty. But just in case the FTC is watching this video and is wondering if it's child directed, I will instead go with a propane torch and some silver solder to fill in the bumper. Once this is fully cooled, I can then sand it down to match the rest of the bumper. With that done, I'll wash each part in some degreaser and set them aside to dry. Once dry, I can then prime them with some sandable primer. I'm doing the primer outdoors since I'll be sanding it down later. By the way, this Dupacolor primer is really nice. It goes on really thin and dries in minutes, so you'll definitely see me using it again in the future. After a couple coats of primer, I can get a good look at how many surface imperfections are going to show through if I was to paint it right now. And there's quite a bit. 
To fix some of the worst of this, I'll apply some filler putty to fill in the pit. Once this filler putty dries, I can go over it with some sandpaper. Or in my case, I like to use emery boards because they're rigid and flat. Nothing magical about any of this, it just takes a lot of time and effort, and you'll need to decide on how much effort you want to put into doing it. This is a rather cheap toy, I found several online for less than $10 and in far better shape, and a tube of this putty costs $5, so keep all that in mind. Here's how everything looked after applying the putty and sanding down the primer. I'll now go over everything with a very light coat of primer and then wet sand it with 2000 grit once it dries. You can see here that everything looks pretty good. I have greatly reduced the pitting, though I certainly haven't removed it all. I'm finally at the point I can start painting. I decided to go with a yellow from Duplicolor. I believe this is to match a Ford Mustang yellow, but it matches up with the original color of this toy just fine. I also like using paints with their primers as they should be made to work with each other. To paint these parts, I cleaned out and modified my airbrush paint booth. The parts are still small enough to fit in it, and I don't plan on going crazy and painting each part with one coat. I would normally set this up in another location, like in my garage, but the temperature has dropped outside below what the paint recommends. So by using my airbrush booth, I can control the temperature a little bit better, and thus control some of the other issues like orange peel, at least to some degree. Again, this paint is easy to use. It dries to the touch in about 15 minutes, so getting through all the parts wasn't all that hard. While I wait for the paint to cure, I decided to work on the riveted rod. There's not enough material for me to recreate the rivet on the end, so I've instead decided to drill a hole in the rod with a lathe and then tap that hole to accept a small screw. If you guys don't like the way this looks in the end, I can always recreate the rod if I need to. After I've drilled and tapped the hole, I can use the lathe to help sand and clean up the rod. Okay, so it's been a few days and the paint has mostly cured and I feel it's safe to start putting things back together. This is pretty much just the reverse of how I took things apart, only I have to take care now not to destroy all the effort I put into the paint. For the small tabs, I would bend them with either the wooden end of a paintbrush or use the jeweler's pliers that you saw earlier. I was sort of surprised how easy it was to put back together, as I was very concerned about tearing up my paint, but it ended up being rather resilient. These paints take weeks to fully cure, and up to that point they are very easy to scratch. However, I have to put this truck back together before the paint fully hardens since I have to bend the metal. If the paint was cured completely, then when I went to bend the metal, it would chip. So I have to get the truck put back together at just the right time to keep that from happening. For the trailer, I'll need to replace the rivet I drilled out when I took it apart. To do this, I'll use a small hand riveter. To use one of these, you place the long tail into the riveter and then place the rivet in the hole. You then close the device and it will flatten the rivet on the back side. You do this several times until the tail breaks off. I could have used a lot shorter rivet, but this was the shortest one that I had, so that's the one I had to go with. Plus, the other side of the rivet will be completely hidden by the panel I'm about to add on next. The panels ended up being very simple to put back on despite my worries about them scratching the paint. I snapped them in place and then bent over the tabs with the end of a paintbrush. Next I need to add in the riveted rod I previously drilled and tapped. This ended up being quite fiddly to say the least, but in the end I was able to get it in place and get the small screw tightened down. I'm not really thrilled with this screw. I may rework this in the future, but it was the smallest screw I could find at the hardware store that had a head big enough to not go through the hole in the gate. The only issue is it's a tapered head screw, and this causes there to be a small gap between the rod and the screw, so I had to install a small washer to fix this for now. I need to find a non-tapered head screw for this online and just order them, but for now this will work. And then the last thing I need to do is add in the back wheels and axles by placing them and then bending the tabs back. In the end I was able to bend all these without breaking them and without destroying my paint. So I breathed quite the sigh of relief when this was done. And speaking of done, here are some before and after shots of the completed model. I have to say this was a nice change for me, but man these things are a lot of work to restore. I own several of the big dump trucks, and I'm glad I started with one of these small toys before trying a large one. Overall, I feel like this was a nice restoration for what I started with. There is still some small pits that I didn't fill that I can see through the paint, but overall it looks good. Earlier I spoke about the rust and how these toys look good with a little rust on them. 
I thought I would propose an idea about putting the rust back onto this toy, though artificially. I could put on the rust and paint the model to scale to make it look like it was a real truck, or I could add the rust on and make it look like it's a rusty toy, though I'm not going for its original rusty look. Or I can leave it alone. Either way, the toy is all sealed up now and no more oxidation of the metal should occur. So be on the lookout for a poll from me sometime early next week, after I figure out how to use the community tab. This will allow you to vote on one of these three options, and I'll make an addendum video on this truck in a few weeks. Otherwise, let me know what your thoughts are on this restoration, and if you'd like to see more of this type of video. As always, I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.